there is nothing to match the exhilaration of seeing a bull elk in full cry. Once before the white man came to North America, millions of elk roamed across the entire continent. Today, these monarchs of the mountains graze mainly in the remote valleys of the Rockies, shunning human habitation. However, in Canada's Banff National Park, to the delight of tourists, elk have almost come to terms with humans. But up close and personal, elk and people don't really mix. And biologist John McKenzie is trying hard to restore a more natural balance between them. For well over a century, Canada's Banff National Park in the spectacular Rocky Mountains has been a haven for what amounts to a living picture book of wildlife. Here, northern predators live protected lives, yet seldom do they extend the courtesy to their prey, the sheep, the deer and the elk, who make up the daily dinner menu. It's an unrelenting land. Life for birds and beasts alike hangs by a thread. And here, every day, far from the tourists' squeamish eyes, life and death drama unfolds. Near the entrance to the National Park in the Bow River Valley lies the town of Banff, a resort that draws tourists from around the world. Since Victorian times, visitors have flocked here. Crystal clear mountain air, postcard vistas, and the chance to glimpse wildlife is what attracts them. But for some lucky people, Banff is where they come to work every day. For John McKenzie, an elk specialist, there's nowhere to compare. I think I really became a wildlife biologist because I was interested in the outdoors and really in animal behavior. What I've always found interesting about elk is the real flexibility in their behavior. They're one of few species that uh, have a real high adaptability to changing environments. But no animal, however flexible, could hope to adapt to the relentless waves of immigrants that arrive to settle a new world. Once, the elk population that ranged from Pennsylvania westward had numbered about 10 million. But they were relentlessly hunted for their meat and hide. What's more, the ivory canine teeth were even sold as popular $15 key fobs in the mid-1800s. It was small wonder that only a handful of elk survived. The remaining herds found refuge in the valleys of the remotest Rocky Mountains around Yellowstone. But when Banff became the world's third national park in 1885, few elk were to be found. The distribution of elk in the Bow Valley and the population numbers were quite low prior to 1900. So around 1918 and 1920, 235 elk were captured in Yellowstone National Park and relocated and released in Banff National Park. To protect the new herds, bears, wolves and cougars were killed off. And today, 2,500 resident elk in the park bear witness. Called Wapiti by the Shawnee, to the Sioux, the elk personified courage, passion, strength, and swiftness. The second largest of the deer family, they're surpassed in size only by their cousin, the moose. Elk have the advantage of being able to browse on plants and trees, which helps them survive when deep snows make grazing all but impossible. A full-grown bull can weigh up to a thousand pounds, cows around 700. More than just a tasty little snack for a predator. 
and all the more reason to have built-in survival sensors that warn of approaching danger. Their eyes detect the slightest movement, and their placement allows them to see forward as well as behind, a definite plus in a land where death creeps up unexpectedly. The elk's ears, like flexible sonar scanners, are constantly plotting potential danger, and combining ears and eyes in a group help the elk avoid predators. In their struggle to survive, a split second's warning can so often decide between life or death. Should they have to escape, their legs are powerful and designed for speed and endurance. Twenty years ago, the sleepy Rockies town of Banff was in for a bit of a shock. Wild elk, obviously out for a good time, paraded through the streets. Mistaken tourists thought Santa's reindeer had escaped. But then animals started picking fights with curious onlookers, not to mention offending public decency. What we've seen over the years is that elk that have concentrated near the town have increased their habituation to human environments. Much of the vegetation in the town, places like the golf course and various parks and lawns, provide a great food source for elk in the town site. So that's really brought them into conflicts with humans. To help prevent serious injuries, John began an intensive study of the problem. My research has had two main objectives. One has been to try to understand more about the movement patterns of elk in the Bow Valley. And secondly, to try to look at ways of trying to restore that more natural distribution of elk. One of the ways of studying elk behavior and movement patterns was to tag and radio collar elk. We selected different colored tags to indicate the location in which they were captured more dominant cows were selected for radio collaring because they tend to lead herds, so they give us a better indication of movement patterns of juveniles and yearlings. Tranquilizing an animal the size of an elk is not always easy. Too little drug means another dart. Too much can put the animal into shock. Like a good doctor, John is careful not to inflict any unnecessary stress on his sedated patient. Following the collaring of these animals, we use radio telemetry techniques, and that allows us to track the animal signal from the collar. And what we found is that there seems to be two types of elk in the Bow Valley. There's an urban habituated population that really don't leave the town site. And then we also have a population in other areas of the Bow Valley that really show an avoidance to the town. And more interestingly, we found that elk in the town site had quite higher rates of survival compared to animals in other parts of the Bow Valley. So what we suspect is that the town site is actually providing a refuge from predation. In the 1950s, wolves came under the gun and were wiped out around Banff. Good news for the elk, but by the mid-1980s, the wolves had recolonized the Bow Valley just outside the town. That's when elk came into Banff looking for sanctuary. Hungry wolves are not an elk's best friend. And yet John's research shows that to get wayward elk permanently off the streets, the answer is to bring them way out here and let them take their chances. In fact, throw them to the wolves. Following the elk around Banff lets John in on the plot of what amounts to a fascinating elk soap opera. Looks like we have another harem over here. There's a bull there up by the tracks, just on the other side of the second lake. And there's a few females just to the left. Yeah, I can count about uh, five of them over there right now. The bull's kind of small, though. Yeah, that bull's pretty small. I'm sure the, the bigger one, the maybe. larger one's probably already crossed over the track. Bulls generally keep out of sight, but as fall approaches, they move into the valleys. 
Most wildlife species have their own unique method of communication. Elk, too, have their own body language. And at close quarters, it's worth knowing what it means. One of the signs we see of elk aggression is lip curling and teeth grinding. So usually if you hear those kinds of sounds and see that, you're probably pretty close. It's a sign that they're disturbed and they're not comfortable in the situation. And one more elk tip worth remembering. What we've often found with behavior, particularly in the town site with aggressive elk, is just prior to when they're about to charge, the ears will flip back. Tourists, be warned. Elk are also the most vocal of the deer family and use a variety of sounds such as chirps, chortles, and barks. Elk will often use barking as a signal to other elk of approaching danger. And it sounds much like a dog. It's a really deep, throaty type of sound. And it carries quite long distances. But the most memorable sound must be the male's bugling. Echoing through the valleys, the three tenors pale by comparison as the elk announce the annual mating ritual. Throughout most of the year, males are found usually in bachelor groups or solitary. It's only in the fall, during the rut season, that they seek out females to establish harems. Dominant males will use bugling to show females the quality of their genes. A louder and deeper bugle is often a sign of a very dominant male. And they'll also use bugles to keep the herd in fairly tight cohesion. Welcome to the rut, the season that separates the elk men from the boys. And when prospective male suitors show what they're made of, from the tip of their antlers right down to their ungulate toes. Cows usually seek out bulls that have large size antlers, antlers that are also symmetrical. This is usually an indication of a very healthy animal and provides the female with better breeding opportunities and reproductive success. Which means that in the elk world, size does matter. The bigger the antlers, the more mature the animal. Every year, the antlers, having served to impress prospective mates, are shed then begin to grow back the following spring by as much as an inch a day, until early summer when they're ready for the mating fray. One of the ways that bull elk compete for females is sparring. What you'll often find is two bull elk that will lock antlers together and try to determine which bull is stronger and will succeed in establishing breeding rights. Associated with this, we'll also have juvenile males that will usually hang out on the periphery. And that can be a problem for a lot of males that have established their harem. They spend a lot of energy trying to keep control over the harem. Younger males that may have not been able to establish their own harems will often try to seek opportunities to mate with cows in the harem. There's not only competition between males during the rut season, there's also competition between females. Because cow elk only come into estrus for 24 hours once every 20 days, more dominant females will often seek the opportunity to mate earlier in the rut season. An early mating means that a cow will have a calf earlier the following summer, increasing the youngster's chances of survival. With up to 26 cows, the bull is seldom bored. To stimulate the cows in a quaint old elk custom, he sprays himself with urine. Downwind, you can tell. The rut season usually lasts just less than two months between September and October. Following the rut, bulls will often leave by themselves or join up into bachelor groups, and they'll stay that way pretty much throughout the year until the following rut season. With winter fast approaching, the cows congregate in the safety of a forest, ever on the lookout for cougars or wolves, and wondering which of them will make it through till spring. The gestation period usually lasts about eight and a half months. 
So calves are born usually between late May and the middle of July. Cows usually have one calf, but two calves are not uncommon. Immediately after the birth, the mother licks her newborn to clear away any trace of smell that might attract a nearby predator. The youngsters will stay with their mothers for the first year and then join other groups of females in preparation for breeding. Protecting her calf from predators is the mother's number one priority. Given half a chance, wolves, cougars or bears will soon gobble up Junior. Brutal, perhaps, but it's all part and parcel of life in the wild. Biologists call it predator-prey dynamics. The predator-prey relationships in the Bow Valley have changed uh, quite significantly over the last 10 years, and elk have concentrated in the town of Banff. So one of my objectives is to try to restore the long-term distribution of elk in the Bow Valley. Like it or not, John's challenge is to provide hungry wolves a little something for their supper, like some fresh elk on the hoof, in the hope that nature will control its own numbers. But getting this walking butcher shop up and running ain't easy. The main highway runs right through the park. And a new multi-million dollar parallel highway built complete with fencing and underpasses to allow for wildlife movement just didn't help in the quest to reunite the elk with their enemy, the wolf. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. One of the impacts of fencing the Trans-Canada Highway was that the fencing became a barrier to wolf movement in the Bow Valley. The population of elk near the town of Banff increased. However, wolves have a hard time accessing the high numbers of elk within the town of Banff, because wolves tend to avoid areas of high human use. What I've always found interesting about elk is the real flexibility in their behavior. They're one of few species that can readily adapt to human environments. Habituation is basically a process that occurs over time where animals first may have avoided human developments, but over time they get used to the sort of consistent pattern of human activity. And so they increasingly began to occupy habitats closer and closer within the town site. Apart from the business and residential side of town, one of the elk's favorite hangouts is the local golf course. Getting the ball onto the green can be a challenge at the best of times. But a bull intent on mating can't simply be shooed out of the way, and skill is required to drive over, chip around, and putt under these additional attractions. Overcoming their fear of humans, some elk have found safety on the greens but those at the other side of the tracks have to contend with a very real and very different world. John is off to investigate an elk that has been taken down by a black wolf on the edge of town. To determine the health of the elk before it was killed, he'll retrieve a piece of its femur bone. Oh, look at that, would you? Well, that's a surprise. I had no idea she was radio collared. Initially, we weren't aware that elk 209 had been killed because we rely on a mortality signal to tell us that the animal has stopped moving. But in this case, we had a golden eagle and an osprey both feeding on the elk. So with the constant movement of the elk in the lake, we weren't able to determine it was a mortality. So upon arriving at the carcass, it was quite a shock to see that it was one of our radio collared elk. Most elk mortality in the park is attributed to wolf or cougar. However, around 40 die from highway traffic and trains each year. Intensively managing the problem of habituated elk in the town site requires large scale relocation. The problem that we have is that we're also trying to restore uh, movement patterns for uh, wolves and other predators around the town. So reducing the number of elk near the town really may not be the best solution for improving habitat for predators. So that brought a little bit of controversy to the program. How many elk should we take out and which elk? It's not an easy job playing God. 
deciding who lives and who dies, or at least comes out here to test their survival metal against the big bad wolves. Through his research, John has been able to tell which of the elk are the most likely troublemakers in Banff, and so become prime candidates for relocation. In the good old-fashioned Western way, these elk are about to be kicked out of town. To try to learn more about translocation, we tried an experimental translocation of elk in the West Bow Valley, about 30 kilometers from the town of Banff. What we found, however, was that up to 75% of these animals had returned within three months. So based on the uh, research from this experimental translocation, we realized that we had to uh, go further with our translocation efforts. After capturing 150 of the most habituated elk in the town site, we relocated them to locations outside the Bow Valley. To maintain a healthy population, Captured elk are put into a holding pen and treated for liver fluke, a common parasite. I guess we'll get 104 and 12 on the far side of the wall here and then just right into the pen. Sure, try to keep 104 in the front. Like most wildlife, elk are unpredictable and John must pay careful attention to their handling. To herd the elk out of the compound and into a waiting trailer, a sophisticated tool is used, a hockey stick that doubles as a defensive weapon complete with a plastic spooking device. It does the trick. Delta 196 Bravo 2, Delta 19. 19, go ahead, John. Hi, Terry, we're just approaching Settlers Road here with the elk. Uh, we're about ready to follow you down the road. Okay, when I see you, I'll just take off ahead of you and get the gate. This relocation site here is about an hour and a half drive from Banff. It's over the Continental Divide. It's really doubtful that the elk will find their way back from this location. So what do you got? You got, you got two elk in this area. Number 104 green. The golf course. Looking right out the window. Which one's the bad one? Well, number 104 has been the real habituated one over the past few years here. And they both got radio collars. They're both radio collared, yeah. All right, they're ours. Since the start of the relocation program, there's been almost half as many reports of aggressive elk in Banff and no injuries, a sign that John's research is paying off. With the translocation of habituated elk from the town site to other areas of the park, we're really trying to only manage insofar as where nature can take its own course. We've now relocated 150 of the most highly habituated elk, so the future will involve monitoring these animals to look at their survival and their reproductive success. And this will give us a better idea on how successful the program will be in the long term. For John McKenzie, relocating habituated, troublesome elk is all in a day's work. But his work has really just begun. Our research on elk near the town of Banff is really one of the first of its kind at a large scale. And we're hoping that some of the information that we learn here will be able to be applied to other areas where elk are habituating to urban environments. Historically, managing wildlife populations was really about trying to control nature and keep it in some kind of balance. But really, I think the changing philosophy today is more about trying to find our place in nature and trying to figure out uh, ways we can coexist with, with species and ensure that they're here for tomorrow. As populations grow and tourism flourishes, trying to achieve that end is a battle. What John McKenzie hopes for is a chance to let humans and elk keep their distance, yet continue to peacefully share this magnificent wilderness of Banff.